All right. Happy Wednesday, brethren. We're glad that you've chose to join us uh, in whatever capacity you're able to join us with today. We're studying the Psalms and we're looking forward to diving into the Psalms tonight and kind of looking at what the Bible has to say to encourage us as we walk close to God. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer together. Would you bow, please? Father, we love you and we honor you. We thank you so much for the opportunity and the occasion to study your word. Father, we pray that it will be a help to us, help it to feed our souls and lift us up. Help us to look to you, uh, especially during this trying time. Help us to always keep you in our focus. Father, help the Psalms to speak to our hearts that we will draw closer to you and walk with you in a way that would be glorifying to you and edifying to us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last time when we concluded our study with the Psalms, we were talking about the Psalms' different literary devices and how the different structures throughout the Psalms are used. The Holy Spirit used many different literary structures. The first one we talked about last week was parallelism. And if you remember correctly, we broke that down into several different areas. There was synonymous parallelism. There was synthetic parallelism, climatic parallelism, emblematic Parallelism, And we gave examples for each of those from the different psalms. The, today we want to pick up with another literary structure known as an acrostic. Now most people are familiar with acrostics. Uh, they are simply uh, uh, maybe a word or a phrase that each letter will stand for a point uh, in that word or phrase. It's a little bit uh, different in the psalms but very similar to that. In fact, the first word of each line of Psalm 119 begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. There are eight verses uh, for each letter, thus 176 verses in the 119th Psalm. That's known as an acrostic. And so you can look at that and um, the Hebrew letters are each represented there, all 22 of them. A third literary structure that the Holy Spirit used in the Psalms is personification. Now again, these are literary structures that we're very familiar with in our English language. If you look at the idea of personification, and if you have your Bibles, look at Psalm 98. Psalm 98 uh, uses the idea of personification. Now someone may ask, well, what is personification? It is using a human characteristic to do something that is non-human. So let's look at Psalm 98 and verse 8. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together. And so you can see joy and clapping is associated with hills and, and floods. And we know that hills and floods don't clap, but he's taking a human characteristic and applying it to a non-human entity. That is known as personification. And that is found throughout the Psalm, Psalm 98 and verse 8 as an example. Another literary structure that is uh, very helping us to really understand the Psalms is what is known as a simile. And a simile is a comparison using the words like or as. Uh, again, Psalm 42 and verse 1. This is a psalm that really thrills many people's hearts. In fact, we sing a song uh, in our song books that is very closely related to this psalm. Psalm 42 and verse 1. As the deer panteth for the water, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. So like a deer would pant for the water and want the water and, and long for the water, so the psalmist says, my soul longs and desires to have you, God. I need you in my life. And so you can see the idea of a, of a simile there, like or as. Now, the next literary structure, very closely associated with a simile, is known as a metaphor. And a metaphor is simply a comparison without using like or as. And if you look at Psalm 23, the most, probably the most beloved psalm in all the collection of the psalms, Psalms 23, it, it really deals with this idea of a metaphor. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, you often think about a shepherd out there with his staff and, and in his shepherdly garb. Well, we know that's really not what the Lord is, but the Lord is like 
a shepherd, although the word is not like there. It's a metaphor. He's a leader. He's one that takes us to green pastures. He's one that leads us beside still waters. And so it's a metaphor. God as our shepherd. These are all literary devices the psalm uses to try to help us to better understand them. And they're literary devices that we use all the time. There are three more quick ones that I want to share that I think are very pertinent to our study. The first of which being irony. And uh, irony is something we use often today, isn't it? How about Psalm 118? And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 118 and look at verse 22. And we're thinking of the idea of irony here. Psalm 118 and verse 22. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. Now this, of course, is quoted in Ephesians chapter 2, and this is uh, applied to Jesus, right? He is the cornerstone. But it's irony. The very corner of the building, the solid structure of the building, the, reject, the builders rejected it. We don't want that cornerstone, and yet he is the one that's the solid structure under the foundation. And so you see irony in that, and that is definitely a literary structure. And of course, that's quoted and given to Jesus. He's the cornerstone of the church, Ephesians chapter 2, 20 and following teach us. If you look at another uh, literary structure, it's called a metonymy. And the metonymy is used throughout the scripture, but we're noticing it in the book of Psalms. Look at Psalm 18, go all the way back to Psalm 18 and verse 2, and someone will say, well, what is a metonymy? A metonymy is simply a vivid comparison. And you can see a lot of these literary structures kind of almost overlap each other, but Psalm 18 and verse 2 is what is known as a metonymy, a vivid comparison. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Now notice how that metonymy, those vivid comparisons of God, he's our rock. What do you think of when you think of a rock? You think of something solid and secure, unmovable. That's our God. And down through there he talks about all these metonymies referring to the Lord God. The last one I want to deal with in the literary structure that we will find as we go through the Psalms is what is called a synecdoche. A synecdoche is simply a part of something to represent the whole. And this is used throughout the Bible, but the Psalms really bring this out. Look at Psalm 7 and verse 3. And this is what is known as a synecdoche, a part to represent the whole. Psalm 7 and verse 3. And by the way, while you're turning there, if we understood the idea of a synecdoche, we would understand a lot better about the Bible's teachings. There'd be some false doctrine that wouldn't be taught. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Let's look at Psalm 7 and verse 3. O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be any iniquity in my hands. Now notice that. Is there iniquity in our hands? Of course, with the virus we find ourselves in, there may be germs on our hands, but there's not iniquity in our hands, is there? No, he's using the hands as a synecdoche to represent the whole, right? Just a quick uh, idea here, it's the same idea in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, where Paul said men ought to always pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And a lot of people think that's the literal lifting up of hands, but it's not. It's lifting up a holy lifestyle before God. It's a synecdoche, and we see it here in Psalm 7 and verse 3. One more I want to look at is Psalm 52, and this comes out very clearly. Psalm 52 and verse 4, and I want you to note this synecdoche. Psalm 50, uh, 52 and verse 4. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. What's he doing there? He's using the tongue really to represent the whole of man. Man, the tongue is deceitful. Well, it's really not the tongue. You know it's the man. It's the mind. It's the entire being. But he's using tongue there as a synecdoche, a part to represent the whole. And that is literally uh, many of the, the Psalms literary structures that will be used as we study these different Psalms. And we'll try to point those out as we go through them. The next section I want to deal with by way of introduction is the Psalms literary genre. 
And so there are different genres in a song, and you know, uh, those that like music, there are different genres, right? There's, you know, blues, and there's, there's rap, and there's country, and there's all different kinds of genres. Well, in the Psalms, it's very much the same. There are different genres in there. When you think about the first one we would look at would be a hymn psalm. And so a hymn is simply praising God for what he has done, especially in redemption. Now, if you think about an example of this, you'd go to Psalm 113. Let's look at Psalm 113. Here's an example of the hymn psalm. And, and basically what a hymn is, we're just praising God. And, and essentially praising God for what he has done. And so a hymn, looking at Psalm 113, uh, just the first couple of verses, Praise ye the Lord, praise, O ye servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same. The Lord's name is to be praised. The whole entire psalm is nothing but a praise psalm, a hymn psalm, looking to God and saying, God, you are magnificent for what you've done in creation, for what you've done in redemption, for what you've done to help me you are magnificent and isn't that important church when we talk about singing to one another in psalms hymns and spiritual songs the hymns are praise songs we're bringing them up before our God and praising him for what he has done the second type of genre we'll see throughout the psalms is known as the lament psalm and you can almost imagine what this would be a lament that's calling to God or complaining to God especially during a trying time now some may say wait a second complaining to God absolutely the psalmist was not afraid to complain to God say God I don't know why this is happening to me and brethren and friends, we need to remember that. God has big shoulders, and he can hear our prayers. And sometimes when we don't understand things, we need to go to him, and we need to allow him to hear our voices. God, why is this happening? Why is this going on to me? That's a lament psalm. Let's look at Psalm 22 as an example of this. Psalm 22 is a lament psalm. Now, when you look at Psalm 22, it's lamenting, David here lamenting, but we know that this ultimately is going to apply to Jesus at the cross. The very first words of Psalm 22 uh, take us right to the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. Now you know Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 22, verse 1 applied to Jesus. One of those famous seven sayings from the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's no doubt a prophetic psalm. But it is also a lament psalm where David is lamenting, God, I've prayed about this and you've not helped me. It seems like you're far from me. Christians, doesn't it sometimes seem like when we pray, God doesn't listen? Doesn't it seem like he's far from us? Well, sure, that's the case. And I believe during those times, we need to pour our hearts out to God. God, I wonder where you're at. I know you're there. Help my unfaith. Help my unbelief. Help me to be what I need to be during these times. And that's what David was doing. He was lamenting a circumstance and a situation in his life. Well, the third genre we look at is the thanksgiving psalm. These are my favorite. They are inundated throughout the book of Psalms. But the, the one that I love maybe the most is Psalm 100. In fact, Psalm 100 is one of my favorite psalms to preach around the month of November. Because it's all about thanksgiving to God. Psalm 100, and I want to read this entire psalm. There's five verses in it. It is such a beautiful Thanksgiving psalm. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations dear friends that's the attitude we need to have when we approach the Thanksgiving Psalm and let me just add a little side note here for Christians in today's world 
Brethren and friends, we need to be thankful for what God has done. Even in the most trying of circumstances, God is still alive. He is still powerful and he's still on his throne. And we need to be thankful for that. We need to enter into his courts with thanksgiving. I would encourage you at this time to just take a minute and write down a couple of things for which you are thankful. Make this Thanksgiving psalm part of your life. Thank God for what he does and what he continues to do. He is an amazing God. Another literary genre that I want to look at is the psalm of remembrance, the remembrance psalm. Let's go back to Psalm 18, and you could kind of probably imagine what this psalm is about. Psalm 18 is a remembrance psalm, and it seems to be a psalm of David, at least he is in the superscription, and it seems that he's speaking unto the Lord, and he's speaking these words, the time that that God had delivered him out from his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So David has been delivered. He's been out of the proverbial dark woods and he sees the light at the end of the tunnel and here's how he breaks out in inspired words. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Now, do you notice there that idea of, of um, uh, um, that one there we talked about was a metonymy. He is a vivid illustration or vivid comparison of what the Lord is. I will call upon the Lord, verse 3, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Some of you may recognize that as a song that we sometimes sing in our worship assemblies. The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. And if you continue to read Psalm uh, 18, you will find that David is just so thankful to God. Thank you for, for remembering me. And it's really a thanksgiving psalm and it's also very much a remembrance psalm remembering God that you delivered me. And I believe very closely akin to a Thanksgiving psalm, we need to remember the, all the things that God has done for us. You know, someone said, he who thinks, thanks. And I believe that to be true. When we remember how good God has been to us, we'll fall to our knees in thanksgiving to him. The next psalm in this uh, idea of different genres is the confidence psalm. And there are many, many psalms in the, the list that really deal with the confidence psalm. I'd like to look at uh, Psalm 16. Psalm 16 is uh, another psalm that will be uh, used to, to look to Jesus. In fact, the last part of it, verse 10, is a direct prophecy regarding the resurrection of Jesus. He was not going to be into the grave uh, very long where his body would begin to decay, but rather he was going to be raised on the third day. And you and I, Christians, know that's true, right? We serve a living Savior. But that psalm is a confident psalm. Psalm 16, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust you notice the confidence there in my soul thou hast said unto the Lord thou art my Lord my goodness extended to thee but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellent in whom is all my delight you notice the confidence he puts in in his God now notice verse 10 for in thou for thou will not leave my soul in Hades neither will thou suffer my thine holy one to see corruption now that's a confident psalm Jesus our lord that was applied to him at, at his burial and we know that when he was buried he had confidence that he would raise again do you remember when those uh, pharisees and scribes asked Jesus for a sign show us a sign and Jesus said I'll show you the sign I'll give you a sign of Jonas he was 3 days in the heart uh, of that well and Jesus said, so shall the Son of Man be in the earth, the heart of the earth, for three days and three nights. And we know that Jesus came forth on that third day. Powerful resurrection, confident resurrection, and that psalm is directly applied to him. David, in Psalm 16, had confidence, and of course, our Lord had confidence as well. The next uh, psalm in John Ray, we have uh, two more we want to just kind of point out, is one known as the Wisdom Psalm. And this is essentially a psalm that teaches man how to live. This is just godly wisdom. I'm only going to reference the psalm because we're going to study this psalm in just a short little bit. But Psalm 1 is known as a wisdom psalm. It talks about how the, wise, or how the righteous man is going to live. How the rebellious man, how he lives is not going to be good for him. So it's a wisdom psalm giving us wisdom on how to live and how to be uh, in our attitudes and our actions toward God. The last type of genre here we want to look at is the royal psalm. These are beautiful. The royal psalm essentially focus on kings. 
sometimes on earthly kings and sometimes on deity as a king. I'll give you a couple of reference points. You can write these down and, and look them up on your own and study them on your own because they're valuable. Psalm 21 deals with an earthly king. Uh, we're going to talk about this at, from an earthly standpoint. Psalm 21 uh, dealing no doubt with David and, and his kingship. And then when we come to Psalm 47 and verse 7, we see God as a king. God is our king. And so you see these are royal psalms. Sometimes dealing with kings on the earth, but many times dealing with with deity, and then of course one of my favorites, and one that should be studied regularly is Psalm 2. And that's talking about the coming Messiah King. Now Christians, we know that when Jesus came, he came as a king, didn't he? He came as a king over his kingdom, the church, and he is reigning today in that kingdom as king. Psalm 2 is prophetic, talking about the time when Jesus would come as a king and rule in his kingdom. If you're a Christian, if you're a New Testament Christian, you're blessed to be in that kingdom. And you're blessed to be uh, being ruled by the Messiah, by Jesus the Christ. What a blessing that is. There's a word that we sometimes see in the Psalms that we just want to touch briefly on before we delve into our deep study of the Psalms. It is the word Selah or Selah. Some people say, well, what does that mean? You will see it uh, often in the Psalms after some of the verses. It'll say, Selah or Selah. Well, first of all, that really isn't to be read. And I think I dealt with this last week when we were together. Uh, men who are reading the scripture, you don't really read that. But what it is is an opportunity to stop and to reflect on what has just been said. It's kind of that um, uncomfortable pause, you might say, when it comes to a speaker. You know, if I were just to say, the Lord is my shepherd, and then I would stop, that'd be kind of a little awkward. But what's the speaker trying to do? He's trying to get you to focus on that. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, there's not a sila after that. I'm simply using that as an illustration. But you'll see that word throughout, and it just literally means to pause and reflect on what was just said. That's our introductory material to the Psalms. Now, if you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to turn to the first Psalm. We're going to deal with five Psalms in book number one. Now, you remember from our study last week, book number one uh, deals with Psalm 1 through 41. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at five different psalms in book one and five different psalms in each of the according uh, psalms. So we're going to be looking at 25 psalms in depth as we go. Psalm 1 is um, a psalm that David is thought to be the author. But if you look at your Bibles, there's no superscription here. So we really don't know who the human penman was. We ultimately know God wrote it. We don't know who he used. Many believe David was the author. Jeremiah 17 verses 5 through 8 has the very almost identical depiction as Psalm 1. What's neat about Psalm 1, it starts with the righteous man and goes to the unrighteous man. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8 does the very opposite. It starts with the unrighteous man and goes to the righteous man. It's in reverse order. So a very, very similar idea in those two texts. Some refer to Psalm 1 as a divine sermon. And when we read it and study it, you will see how it truly is a divine sermon. So let's read Psalm 1 together. There are six verses in it. Let's read it together. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish." Now let's just give kind of a summation of this psalm because sometimes people go to this psalm and they say, well, it appears that everything a righteous man does will prosper. So there's nothing you can do as a righteous man that will fail. Well, that's not what this psalm is teaching. In fact, 
we know that oftentimes the righteous do live in unfavorable circumstances, do meet with things that, that aren't very favorable upon this earth, right? I think about Job. Job was a man that feared God. He had all these blessings and he lost them just about overnight. Ten funerals, seven sons and three daughters. He lost his camels, he lost his ox, and he lost his health. Even his wife, which we don't want to be too hard on Mrs. Job, but essentially she kind of turned and said, just curse God and die. Job, how could that happen? Remember his friends, his three friends that came to him said, Job, it must be you. You must be a sinner because all these bad things are happening. That's not true. Righteous people suffer certain things upon earth just like the unrighteous. The difference is we know where our real hope is. I want to stop there for a minute. I want to think about our current pandemic in our world today. We know where our hope is, don't we, Christians? I feel terrible for somebody that's facing this world with all its troubles, with all its turmoils, and they have no hope. If our hope is here, we're miserable. But let me tell you, my hope is in Jesus Christ. The righteous know really where the hope comes from. What about Daniel? Daniel was a righteous man, and yet he suffered affliction, didn't he? In fact, he suffered affliction for standing for God. He was thrown in a den of lions for standing up for God. But God took care of him. And that's the point here. God will take care of the righteous no matter what. Paul, Peter, John, all of them, all the apostles, every one of them, many, many Christians in the first century suffered very, very terrible circumstances. And we find out that those circumstances really ultimately would turn out for good because God was their savior. God was their hope. This psalm does not teach that every enterprise in which a righteous person engages will be successful. I want you to think about that for a minute. You remember Noah? Noah preached for 120 years while the ark was preparing. Now outside of Noah's family, we read of no converts of Noah. But you know what? Was Noah successful? He was, now not by man's standard, man said he wasn't a very successful preacher. He didn't save anybody in that world. But we know he was successful, but not by man's standards. What about Jeremiah? Jeremiah preached, and we find in his book, not one convert. He preached to a group of people that nobody turned to him. You would think to yourself, Jeremiah, you weren't very successful. And yet Jeremiah is held up as one of the greats. The weeping prophet of old, he was a great, great man. So not everything is gauged by man's standards upon this earth. Paul preached and was persecuted. Was Paul successful? He absolutely was. You go read 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6 through 8. You'll find out Paul was very successful. He knew he had a home in heaven and he knew it was to come. This psalm, Psalm 1, also does, not, uh, does teach one thing, though. It teaches an important principle that we need to always understand. And I hope our young people understand this. I hope we all understand it. That all things will ultimately work for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, Romans 8 and verse 28. The righteous will always prevail in the end. Maybe not upon this earth, maybe not today, but remember, God doesn't settle all his accounts on Friday, as someone once said. We are waiting and waiting on God to take care of us, and we know that ultimately he will. Well, how then is this psalm true? It says, blessed is the man. How is the man blessed? How is the man blessed? And how does he prosper as a righteous person? Well, let me think about some other parallel passages that go with Psalm 1. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Matthew chapter 6. And this is really uh, essentially what this passage is saying. He's talking about the righteous man and one who is following God. And you remember Jesus brought up that same scenario. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 beginning all the way through the end of the chapter. You remember Jesus said, uh, no man can serve two masters. Essentially the same thing as Psalm 1. You're either going to be righteous or you're going to be rebellious. One of the two. For either you'll love the one and, or either you'll hate the one and love the other or else you'll hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Now notice. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink or what ye should put on. Now all the way down through Matthew chapter 6, his main gist is you don't really need to worry. I'm going to take care of you. 
That's how the righteous prosper. We know tonight when we pillow our head that we ultimately know God will take care of us. Listen, brethren, it doesn't matter what tomorrow holds. It doesn't matter if the earth falls apart tomorrow. God will take care of the righteous. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. We are a blessed people. We are people that really need to thrive and really need to understand our blessings in God. I love Psalm 37 and verse 25. It goes right along with Psalm 1. I have been young and now I'm old, the psalmist said, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. The righteous will never be forsaken by, forsaken by God. And dear friends, that's a promise that we can count on. That's a sure guarantee we can know beyond any shadow of a doubt. Let me give you kind of an outline to Psalm 1. It outlines itself very well. There are two main points. The first point is the righteous man, verses 1 through 3. The second main point is the rebellious man, verses 4 through 6. Now let's break that down. The righteous man, verses 1 through 3. He's first looked at sort of from the negative side. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So he's looking at it from like, kind of like what he doesn't do. This is what the righteous man doesn't do. But verse 2 gives us the positive side of that. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate both day and night. Do you see that negatively? Positively, this is what he doesn't do. This is what he does. Very balanced in the approach. And then verse 3, this is what the righteous is consequently. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Do you notice that? This is what he doesn't do. This is what he does. And here's the consequence of that. God blesses his life. He is a rich, thriving, like a tree. Dear friends, I'm going to tell you, when we do it God's way, we are thriving. We are thriving spiritually. And that's really what matters in this life. Second, four through six, the rebellious man. It breaks itself down into three beautiful points as well. First of all, it talks about his stability. Look at verse 4. The ungodly are not so. Not so like what? He doesn't stand as secure as the righteous man. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff that are driven uh, away by the wind. Now, if you notice that, the idea is that these, these wheat sheaves would be brought together and the, the wheat would be taken down and drop into the, to the mill, and then the chaff was just left what's left over, and they would just let it fall on the barn floor. And you know what would happen? That wind would go in there and whip it, and it would just blow it around everywhere. That's how the ungodly are. Their stability is zero. They don't have a place to stand. They don't have security. Don't you look around our world and see that? People that don't have the hope of Jesus Christ, what hope do they have? What stability do they have? Wherein can they stand? Nowhere, because the only place to stand is in Jesus Christ and in his word. Secondly, he talks about their standing. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You know what this really points to is the very fact that when they see God, they're going to be on their knees. They're going to be begging for God to give them another chance. But dear friends, it'll be too late. Do you remember the Apostle Paul said, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess? Let me tell you, there won't be an atheist on the day of judgment. There won't be somebody who's ungodly and lived an ungodly life on the day of judgment. They'll be believers then, but it'll be too late. Dear friend, make sure that we're on the right side of things today. Make sure we're that righteous man while time still stands. And then lastly, verse 6, he gives the sentencing for it. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You talk about a wisdom psalm. You talk about filling our souls with wisdom. Do things God's way. Don't stand in the seat, uh, way of sinners. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Don't walk by the way with ungodly people, but delight in God's word. Delight in the Lord, and you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The ungodly aren't so. Wisdom teaching us how to live and how to conduct our lives. Here's the application of that psalm as we conclude this Bible study. We all have a choice, and choices have consequences. Dear friends, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus brought this forth so clear. He brought it forth in verses 13 and 14. Let's close with those two passages. Thinking of the righteous life and the rebellious life, which will you choose? Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 13, beginning, Enter ye in at the straight gate. 
For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the way, uh, gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, few there be that find it. What did Jesus say? There's two choices. You can be rebellious or you can be righteous. The choice is yours. Friends, I'm glad you were able to join us in this Bible study. I pray that it lifted your soul as it lifted mine. May we live righteous lives. May we live close to the cross so that heaven will be our eternal home. Join us again next time when we bring another Bible study from the great book of Psalms. God bless you.